Inhale, people. Yeah, we are just going to wait for more people to join slowly. Mm -hmm. yeah, we are going to wait around two minutes. Mm -hmm. Welcome everybody, good afternoon. For the people joining just now, we are just waiting a few minutes so more people can join us today. So we are going to start now. Welcome to our webinar uh, on inclusive student engagement as a driver of quality education in professional higher education. So as part of the housekeeping rules for today, um, today's event, I kindly ask you to please write your, your questions in the chat and you can raise your hand for, for questions during the discussion part. Um, and we will give you the floor. Um, kindly note that this meeting, this uh, webinar is being recorded um, for reporting purposes. <laughs> so our agenda for today, firstly, uh, I will start by guiding you through uh, the inclusive PHE project and the approach uh, and the progress that we have been making so far. Uh, and then this contextualization uh, will be followed by a roundtable discussion about uh, inclusive student engagement in professional higher education in PhD, um, from policies to practices uh, with experts in the field. So unfortunately, Valerie uh, from the Support uh, Center Inclusive Higher Education in Belgium cannot join us today, um, but we will have our two other experts uh, to comment on, on some aspects. Um, later on, uh, we will learn from the University College Leuven Lindbergh uh, about their strategies in place for promoting effective inclusive student engagement. And across this webinar, uh, we will have interactive polls and discussions uh, with the audience where we expect an active participation from, from your side. So um, Yurashi is a partner uh, in the Inclusive PhD project, and this project stands for inclusive engagement of non-traditional students in professional higher education. Um, professional higher education institutions uh, have mo a more practical orientation and uh, <coughs> sorry, are attracting a large number of new student groups, the so-called non-traditional students. Um, and to be uh, truly inclusive, um, these institutions must reflect the, the diversity of these kind of students and the, their needs. Um, the main mission of this project is to, of course, improve uh, the policies and mechanisms and the practices in professional higher education institutions uh, for the inclusive student engagement of non-traditional students and uh, pursuing the vision uh, that inclusive student engagement um, in professional higher education institutions is linked to a full uh, engagement of all students in all uh, the aspects of teaching and learning, institutional decision making, and student life and participation in the wider sense. So, as project objectives, um, we have three main ones. Uh, so, to enhance the understanding of existing practices and identifying good practices. Also, to promote uh, increased participation of non-traditional student groups, 
and to develop strategies and tools uh, to support the development of an, uh, an inclusive student engagement culture. As project outputs, um, we started by um, mapping and collecting good practices. Uh, so the consortium has published a, a mapping document about the needs assessment for student uh, engagement of um, in PhDs, so non uh, traditional students engagement in professional higher education. Uh, it's already uh, published in the project website. Um, also, uh, as another project output, we have the strategies and guidelines for uh, inclusive student engagement uh, in these institutions and uh, in student organizations as well. So we are developing a, a space in the project website where we'll, we'll be placing assessment tools um, that once developed, we, we will be sharing with our contacts and also the consortium will be sharing with their contacts as well. Uh, and last but not least, the online toolkit and the training resources for uh, an inclusive student engagement um, that it's already ongoing. So uh, a quick introduction just about uh, what Hirachi is and what we stand for uh, before we start our discussions. Uh, so Hirachi stands for uh, European Association of Institutions in Higher Education, particularly focused on um, professional uh, oriented uh, higher education and uh, we are engaged in strengthening the impact of innovative high quality uh, professional higher education applied research in Europe and uh, by representing those institutions and facilitating the cooperation and dialogue between them. Uh, nowadays the Urashi members are colleges, polytechnics, university colleges, uh, universities of applied sciences and universities that have uh, their own uh, professional training. Uh, so if you want to uh, know more about it, you can visit our website or sending us an email. So now we would like to get to know you better. So we are going to launch a, a poll. Um, just a second. Hope you can see it now. Yes, I think you can. So. Um, I would, I would like to know which um, of these um, categories you represent, uh, who you are here today. You have student representatives, researchers, policy makers. We have many other. <laughs> you can type it in the chat um, from which category you you represent. We are getting more answers, but most of uh, the people here are student representatives, policy makers, researchers, uh, we have teachers as well, and we have others. I would like to, to know more about the others category uh, in the chat if you can type it there, your answers. Um, And you already replied about uh, the question about from where you are coming from. So uh, mostly from higher education institution. Um, also people, 50% of the people from professional higher education institution, quite interesting. Um, not surprising though. Um, student services, student unions, quality assurance body and national institution. I'm gonna share now. 
the results with you so you can have a look. And you have student support staff also in, the, in this webinar today. Okay. So moving on, now that I know a bit more about you, um, I want to hear from you what's in your opinion a non-traditional student. I ask you now to uh, type it in the chat. Uh, feel free to raise your hand if you want to elaborate a bit more on your answer. Uh, but please share what comes to your mind um, when you think about a non-traditional student. I don't know if you are able to type it. Um, we are just checking that now. Mm -hmm. Yes. We have some uh, answers, of, co of course, from our uh, panelists that can access the chat, that's for sure. Uh, so we, uh, it's uh, for Adele, he, a non-traditional student, uh, it's a minority from a minority group, um, disabled, a person with disabilities, an immigrant among others. Uh, okay, I see now you are able. I'm sorry for this before, but I see now we have mm -hmm. a student that feels underrepresented. Very good. Student to engage more in learning also uh, out from his, his university. <clears throat> Don't forget that uh, if you want, you can elaborate uh, further your, your answer or you can just um raise your hand we'll give you the floor uh, so, so you can do it uh more adult students from that uh, group student with neurodiversity profile very interesting a retired person studying all the answers here uh, are valid, of course, because it's your perception about a non-traditional student. So you can continue typing um, your answer in the chat. Uh, person that study and work, yes, as well. And we can explore now um, a bit on the term of non-traditional students. So it's a, a broad uh, concept used in the context of higher education in general. Uh, and according to some sources that we included in the report I mentioned uh, at the beginning of the webinar uh, on uh, this mapping and collection of good practices, uh, we have uh, non-traditional students defined as uh, by their diversity, which can be applied to uh, differences uh, like age, ethnicity, gender, skin color, uh, nationality, um, physical, mental, and emotional uh, abilities among many, many others. So we had some, some answers in that um, aligned with that. Uh, and also we, we explore that we also explore this in our, in our report, the principles and guidelines to strengthen the, the social dimension of higher education in the European higher education area. A report, it refers to a broad classification of student groups, so which can be applied uh, to better understanding the context of non-traditional students, of course. And the first group is mentioned as the underrepresented students that was mentioned uh, by the participants here. Uh, they are underrepresented um, in relation to certain characteristics uh, like gender, age, nationality, uh, social background, for example. And uh, com when compared to um, other students um, that they are lower rep uh, represented. 
And also the second group uh, are the disadvantaged students uh, that face specific challenges when compared to the, their peers and that are students uh, in higher education or specifically in professional higher education. Uh, just another uh, quick um, mention about uh, the concept. So the non-traditional students are a very large and heterogeneous uh, group as we, we can understand from the answers as uh, if we reflect about um, the origins of the student, the background, and it's in constant uh, mutations. So therefore we are unable to stick to a precise definition. We have different categories and um, this, is, this will be uh, about what we are gonna talk today. Um, and just one last question for everybody to, to answer, to reflect on is uh, what does student engagement mean to you? You can again, type it in the chat or raise your hand. Okay, so student engagement, meaning participation, students as partners, so as part of the consultation, uh, stakeholders, exactly in the processes in higher education, active participation, interest in uh, a lot of different fields, yes, um, taking responsibility for uh, more students than yourself, very interesting. Um, participation in decision making, active participation and commitment in activities or in councils, consultations, among others. So it's if we pick one word, I think participation is the main one, um, the key word here, um, and also consultation. So yeah, I think we are aligned on this. Being uh, valid and engaged in a student-centered teaching environment. Very interesting. This is also linked to, to the quality assurance uh, topic uh, and quality of education that we, we will be exploring today. So yes, um, I don't see more new answers, but you can continue typing. We, we will consider all the answers then for the reporting of of this webinar. We have also listening to and uh, benefiting from the experience of students during their time in professional higher education. Okay, so we are gonna um, move now to the, to the discussion, to the round table discussion. Um, I would like to ask uh, Adel and Bjorn to, um, that will be our panelists today, our experts in the topic, uh, to uh, present themselves, to introduce themselves and to introduce their institutions that they represent. And then we'll go uh, to the questions. Go ahead. Thank you. Okay, so should I start then? Um, my name is Bjorn and I'm um, the executive officer of international affairs uh, well, at the National Union of Students in Norway. And I've been there since last summer. I've been engaged in student politics and um, student organizations since I first started studying um, five years ago. And um, and I started studying at the Western Norway University of Applied Sciences. And it's, um, so it's an, a university of applied sciences and I, um, it's interesting though because I haven't been that familiar with uh, professional or higher education, even though we are a university of applied sciences. Um, we have some different categories in Norway as well, but they are um, different, I would say, and uh, it varies a little bit. Um, so usually we we don't 
uh, we haven't really been using uh, the word professional higher education, but we do consider ourselves uh, to be, and that's in the strategy as well of the university, to be um, a university of uh, professions, <laughs> uh, to, to have studies um, going into a profession. So it's mostly uh, nursing school, it's, um, it's accounting, where I come from. I've been studying um, business administration myself, uh, and then it's uh, engineering and, and teachers. That's the four uh, main categories of the university where I come from. Um, so that's uh, me. Now I live in Oslo. Um, and uh, in, in this position, I'm trying to represent Norwegian students abroad and also to to work with internationalization um, and international students coming to Norway. So that's that's uh, what I do full time now uh, at, the, at the National Union of Students in Norway. Thank you very much, uh, Bjorn. Uh, Adil, can you please introduce yourself also? Hello, everybody. I'm Adil Rizvi, uh, currently living in Finland. Uh, I'm the representative from Samok basically the University of Applied Sciences, Student Unions of New Unions, aka the National Union of uh, University of Applied Science Unions. And, oh, that was too many unions. <laughs> uh, but yes, uh, I'm a nursing student myself, our, and my university is a UAS too. And uh, we, we do technically, the term professional higher education was something that I was introduced to this year, to be honest. Before that, it was not uh, a normal lingo. The, no the normal lingo over here was the University of Applied Sciences. And uh, just like Bjorn had mentioned, there are more of those fields where you have basically applied work-life uh, experience. So nursing, engineering, multiple different variations of engineering, uh, IT fields, Teaching, unfortunately, not is it's not one of the parts of the University of Applied Sciences. That's a university degree, but you can become a teacher from the UAS too. But by completing a higher UAS degree, where over there you can gain the skills for becoming a teacher, uh, because that requires in Finland some work experience to be able to talk directly from work life and bring that specialty with you on the teaching sides. Uh, and my duties in SAMOC are services, international affairs, and local internationalism. So when you just hear these terms, they sound very gibberish. So I will open up a little, open it up a bit. But uh, services in turn uh, generally means the services that we as a national union providing to the local student unions and uh, event organizations and partnership collaborations and other such things. International affairs, working with uh, EU sectors and globally, like so external, out of Finland, international things. And the local internationalism, just like the term suggests, it's international affairs inside the country. So developing the status of international students, uh, et cetera. But yeah, that's about me. Thanks a lot uh, for the great introductions and interesting introductions. Um, so I'm going to start with the first question. You can decide who starts first. Uh, so what's the, the what are the biggest uh, barriers that uh, non-traditional students face in professional higher education institutions in this context of professional higher education? Should I go first then? Um, okay. Well. Um, the first thing I, my first thought when I um, read this question uh, in my preparations was um, whether or not there actually was a difference between uh, barriers and challenges in professional higher education um, compared with, uh, well, other higher education institutions. Uh, but uh, put that aside um, and uh, I would say, uh, well, for non-traditional students, um, it's uh, it's often more difficult 
uh, to um, to study and to I mean, if you are a migrant, for example, you have other difficulties than a more traditional suit would have. Uh, or if you're disabled, you have more. I mean, there's um, there's often more uh, difficulties uh, with non uh, traditional students that tradi traditional students don't have to deal with, and therefore um, uh, it's even more important that um, that the institutions uh, facilitate for well all students, but including um, the non traditional ones. Um, because that makes it possible uh, for them to to study um, and and to and to well be active participants um, of the society um, and um, well the the main barriers I would say would be maybe uh, well it could be language um, it could be uh the uh, the physical um, um classrooms i mean to to be able to actually access uh the web page could be as well uh, if you if you have some disability with uh with your vision um and um yeah so i i would say the biggest uh challenges barriers uh are very diverse actually <laughs> and and for um well uh, for to to make sure that non-traditional students can access higher education as well they uh the universities need to be universally uh, accessible um yeah thank you very much Adol, what we have, do you have to say about the, the barriers, the biggest barriers uh, for non-traditional students? I'm going to pretty much echo what Bjorn said. They're, they're pretty, pretty much the similar things. And it, depending on your definition of what a non-traditional -trad student is, that group has its own selective challenge. Like if you were to take disabled people. Now, disabled people have a very short range, like a short variety of things that they can actually choose from, the kind of fields that they're going to be able to work. Like, uh, for example, a person in a wheelchair, nursing is not going to be an accessible field. But does that mean that they would not be a good nurse? Not necessarily, because the kind of skills that the field requires, there, there's such a wide variety of skills that can be used in these things. So the limitations that have been now set, like traditional limitations of what a certain field means, how are that like how do we cross them? How do we open them? How do we make them bigger, wider, and more accessible in general, in all sense? Because if you were to think a few like hundred years back, it would be not common to have a person of color in certain fields. But that was that was then opened up late, later on, that it became broader, it became more accessible for everyone, thus making it more close of people and making it more engaged in sense so that you took a group of people's needs in in, uh, into account and started providing better service for them. The same way, depending on whichever uh, non-traditional group of students we're talking about, such services should be brought up, such aids. And like, if you were to think about Finland, again, Finnish is not the easiest language, if I'm right, it's one of the top hardest languages in the world, maybe even the third or fourth ranking one. Yeah, so that does play a big role in Finland when you have, when you talk about uh, like foreign background students who, again, would not cons be considered as traditional students in this case. And uh, a lot of other problems would be like for people who, are lifelong learners or people with families, the way that the studies, like uh, educational structure has been built is so difficult to adapt because for a person who works every day, you're going to have to try and find a balance. But depending on the field that you're studying, that also cannot be a possibility because uh, you would not be able to work and 
like study because your work times and education times are going to be the exact same time. So that brings its own challenges. So you're going to have to choose one from the other. Then you have to think about, is your partner going to be able to take up this load that now you're technically just dumping on them? Even though that's not what really happens, unfortunately, a lot of times education is seen as burden these days. So these kind of barriers should be like taken away or eased up in a sense where they would be able to more easily access these educations. But yeah. Thank you very much. So um, I would just like to elaborate a bit further on why in professional higher education institutions, why non-traditional students in this context? Because as I previously mentioned, um, these kind of institutions attract more um, a, a, a diverse uh, range of, um, of students from uh, different backgrounds, diff different uh, social um, economical backgrounds. So this is one thing. And the other thing is that in the in the project we already identified um, similar problems and barriers that uh, student in, in it's facing student engagement context, uh, being a time and financial problems. Um, that is a bit cross cutting. Um, visibility problems of student engagement results and opportunities. Also, the accessibility problems of student led organization, among many others. Uh, but thank you very much also for your uh, inputs. And how would you prevent uh, and overcome these challenges? Because some of them, perhaps uh, the institutions and student orga or organizations can um, prevent them and overcome. What would you say about it? Yeah, okay. So um, I, I kind of started answering that question as well a little bit uh, with the university universal accessibility uh, but i could add a little bit which is uh, more specific for uh, professional higher education institutions um for example um uh, with uh nursing from my university and and from norway in general you often have to travel a lot or to move even um to to get a work experience um during your degree um becoming a nurse or a teacher um and those expenses you often have to cover yourself and you might not even um get information on where you have to go uh until very late <laughs> so um something you could do in those uh situations where you have uh work experience as a part of the degree is to try to um well plan ahead and uh get information out there early so that it's easier to uh, plan for it um um and also to cover some of the expenses uh if if possible um there are some universities trying that out uh in Norway and um and uh and that could definitely be a way of making it easier and, and more accessible for uh for students if you don't have to like if you don't have to rent two apartments at once basically. Um most Norwegian students don't live at home when studying. Um so so that is often very financially demanding if if uh, if you have to do uh, two apartments at once. Sure. Adel, what do you think about it? Um, one of the points that you just made earlier, Martha, was the fact that uh, professional higher education attracts a wider range of people. I believe that's because the kind of uh, marketing or the kind of accessibility that's available for professional higher education is different to your traditional universities because traditional universities demand that you have a high level of literature and like do certain kind of like qualifications before you get there whereas in professional higher education you it is more about how can you do the work so what kind of so like it gives you an opportunity to be able to 
like do something in a different way. You do not need to be book savvy altogether. You you can be you can be good with books, but at the same time learn about doing it with your hands or learn it through work life. And that is like the biggest selling point here in Finland that it is easier to access, it's easier to get into, but later on the the struggles are the same pretty much. The education is still difficult and all the other stuff are the same. But uh, about the barriers that uh, would have to be overcome, I would suggest like uh, if we were to talk about like I need a certain group. Could you suggest a certain group of non-traditional students? And I'll base off of that. Yeah, we can consider, for example, uh, a professional that decides to go back or to start their education, uh, their higher education uh, career. So let's think about it, uh, this example. First. Yes, over there now, there's a lot, uh, a lot of kind of problems when you come from a person who is now older in age and they have more experience in life. So it's already a big deal for them to try and come to, to re-educate themselves. And then you're dealing with a person who is so different in the age demographic with the students who are probably studying there, like their early 20s, et cetera, whereas you're now dealing with a person who may be in their 40s or late, like early 50s even at times. So in Finland, I've heard of people who are studying in their 60s even. That's not an uncommon practice. But what that does is that it puts... Uh, a social barrier amongst these two group of people. As such, they do not uh, take part in the social activities of a student life. They do not consider student activism, activism as a thing, because there's a slight detach to the fact that, oh, I'm older, I've just come to study and leave. That's all there is to it. So like over there, the barriers would be to try and integrate the uh, student society better. Because that is something, not going to lie, due to COVID that many countries and many students lost, was the student culture, student community, being part of a group, and the exchange of knowledge and experience through that. So be, trying to include this person as part of the community, making them be uh, belong as part of the group, taking their experience into, like, taking it, giving it value for what it really is. Because when you have a non-traditional student who is so much older, whatever experience they bring to the game is a lot more helpful too, because there are so little of them, whatever they give is good. And that is something that I have firsthand witnessed in my last year in the, in the local student union, where we had older uh, student representatives taking part in student active stuff you could clearly see a different way of doing things. And they passed on their knowledge to the other newer students. And uh, like, these, this is a simple barrier, a social structure barrier is an easier one to deal with in comparison to the other stuff that you have, for example. But yeah. And how more concretely can a student support services and student associations support and be supported by the institutions themselves? Um, if I just continue with the same flow, uh, the student unions in Finland, at least in our university, I'll take that my UAS as an example over here. In our UAS, they try and support the students as much as they can to the point where they literally just wait for a little uh, like spark from a student to just put things into motion. So like one thing that has been uh, try now being worked on is to make better student societies, student communities. So they decide to give student lounges a go where you'll be able to just openly socialize, have more fun and stuff. This is something that's common throughout many other countries and many other universities too. But with COVID and since our university campuses have been new, such facilities was not available. So it takes a little bit of lobbying from the student unions to the higher boards of the university that, hey, we need something like this. This is the problem. Here's a solution. It would maybe cost you this much or it's free because a lot of the times you don't really need to put monetary funds into it. 
is just a means of arranging it the right way. And this kind of like direct lobbying is very helpful when it comes to student unions to universities of applied sciences. Then if you were to take the national level, it would be raising awareness altogether to the problems. Like for example, right now, again, post COVID, we have a big mental health crisis going on. So trying to bring, and currently we have our parliamentary elections going on. It's the advanced votings ended like yesterday from right or day before. Yeah, day before and the final election day is on Sunday. So what we've been doing with SUL, who is the university sites national union, is lobbying to the ministers and voters and electors that why you should vote for people who actually will bring changes for students. What is the importance? Why is it something that needs help? What kind of benefits do we get out of it? Because a lot of the time society has forgotten the fact that students are the future's workers. So if the students don't feel well, they're not gonna be doing well later on either. And thus that's going to like crash the society worse. So these kind of like large scale national influencing can also be done. But yeah, we are. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Okay, so I'll first just uh, mention one more uh, barrier I, I remember um, for um, non traditional students um, mandatory education. Uh, that's something we have a lot of, especially within professional higher education institutions. And um, that could be very difficult if you have a disability, if you're, if you, you do, if you study part-time, if you try to combine uh, studies with uh, work full-time, or if you have children. So um, I would say mandatory uh, education is also a barrier for, especially for non-traditional students. Um, but then over to the question about student support services more in general for all students, not only non-traditional ones. And um, well, to me, um, student organizations and associations are uh, a arena um, for students to uh, well participate and to um, to. Uh, express uh, yourself and uh, to contribute to the student uh, society, to the um, environment of, uh, of your university and um, yeah, and to, um, well, formalize uh, in a formalized way because you could also, of course, uh, I don't know, uh, express yourself individual as an indiv individual, but um, having student organizations um, as a place for uh, students to meet and to, to discuss with each other, then um, they can contribute uh, in what we will move on to later, maybe uh, the quality assurance of universities and also, I mean, to the uh, to the well being more broadly uh, of students. Um, yeah, and student participation. Yeah, and uh, still on this topic, do you know about uh, any example of project and practices? in place in your institution or when you were students, uh, you are still, uh, and equity plans uh, that you have in the institution that you can uh, share with the audience that allow and boost this um, student engagement. You wanna go? It's fine. Well, I, I was wondering a little bit actually if, uh, this was from the universities, I mean, projects and practices? Both. Um, I would say from uh, the institutions themselves and the student association um, that are 
place in the in the, in the institution. So we can have projects, uh, projects, policies, practices, uh, plans, uh, well, very well defined plans. So do you know about uh, an example to share with us? Um, oh, maybe Adele can go first, and I'll <laughs> try to continue. Uh, one example would be of what we as Stamok have done is the equity plan. The equity plan is the, because let me go from the base of it. So by law, every uh, institution of higher education needs to have an equity plan. So an equity plan has been drawn. In a survey that was done about them, uh, it was noticed that yes, there is a plan, but it covers more about the staff or how the staff are treated better or students are just mentioned. So upon noticing this kind of a problem, Samok, to, like by the support of the cultural and education ministry that they, of, they funded the project, that's the equity plan project. And in the equity plan project, what the whole goal was to try and design and give ideas for one, how to make an equity plan, what should you take into consideration, what kind of groups of people are you talking about, what kind of uh, metrics are you supposed to use to define whether that equity has been successful or not, and how to like do all of that. So just the plan making to begin with, and then uh, how to execute it, how to put it into process, how to use the plan to effectively get equity amongst all of these universities and universities of applied sciences. And this in turn would be a like, when, once this project is done, it will be producing questionnaires, plan, based plans that you can work off and uh, a tool, like an online course, which uh, like teachers, students, universities, everybody could access for free and learn about what equity means and how to actually put it into practice. And the goal, the final goal would be to try and make this a course that could be like gained from, like you can gain ACTSs from that so that it will be recognized as a course and be part of the education system itself. But that's one thing that comes to mind. Okay. Um, well, I do know that uh, universities usually do have some policy uh, on, on this uh, topic um, uh, and that we also do have like national agencies um, looking after uh, the universities, making sure they, uh, um, they uh, apply. Um, all the rules and regulations on this, um, especially with uh, with with the physical um, accessibility and um, that yeah, uh, so so that's one thing of it, like the judicial part of it, and and, and the more like policy part of it, um, but. Uh, well, for the student associations, um, it's, uh, I would say, I, I have one example of, like, uh, with non-traditional students um, having, uh, um, using English, actually, as their main language, um, to, to uh, well, to include more of the non traditional students, uh, especially those, well, international students and, and students with, um, well, maybe migrant students as well. Um, but, you yeah, know, I don't really have that many other uh, examples. It's mostly uh, in the law and, and uh, well, the agency of quality assurance also uh, follow up on this uh, when they do reviews of the universities. Thank you both very much. And good that you uh, mentioned the quality assurance again, because 
I would like to hear from you. How do you understand the role of student engagement in the quality assurance of the institution, of the higher education institution? You can give some examples of concrete benefits uh, for students in their learning processes as well. Yeah, then maybe I can start on this one. Um, so uh, to me, uh, students are uh, stakeholders uh, and and it's uh, to me, it's obvious that students should be uh, a part of, uh, well, the development of, of the universities um, and uh, to to us uh, we um, believe and and it seems to us that um, the experience of the students uh, also correlates a lot with um, whether students have been uh, participating in the uh development of the universities or not if they have been included um uh, we believe that all both the students and the universities and teachers are um they are uh well it, it's good for all uh, parts uh, of the university structure to uh include students um, um and um uh, yeah, so, and, and also to be a part of this university democracy, um, um, I, I, I believe, and we believe that students are a natural part of that. Um, so, uh, so it's both uh, a fundamental principle to us that we believe that students should be included, but it's also in a more um, pragmatic from a more, more well, pragmatic perspective, uh, clever to include students because it seems to me that you get better results and less uh, conflicts uh, if you do. Um, my personal experience directly comes from like the last year's audit process that our UAS had. So we they right away when they started planning about it we were taken we were contacted and asked to be part of three out of four of the work groups that were working on the qa process the only work group that we weren't part of was the one that was relating to staff and staff related stuff so that wasn't something that we have expertise on so we were there for all the others so education uh intercultural things um the education planning all of these stuff so that that showed us how strongly we could influence the whole process so in this qa process we could uh we basically rewrote a lot of different parts of the qa documents and directly could be like no your your perspective on this is a bit flawed since in the student's perspective, this is what really happens. And we could give such clear cut image, like imagery on those stuff, like what was really happening. And later on in that QA process, we also had different groups of students. So students who were not student actives at all, or students who were part of the non-traditional groups who could bring up directly their concerns about the issues that, the, that were being dealt with. And these were directly taken into account. And these were all the things that are going to be changed now in the future. So like they're working on developing these things and making them better. And I can tell you, like since the end of the quality uh, assessment process of last year to now already, there are so many different like things that they've brought up in our University of Applied Sciences, like starting out support groups or hangout nights where uh, where you basically just can be yourself and communicate with faculty, where you can just get to know people easily and count, try like bring reduce the gap in between faculty and students. Because when they both collaborate is when there's going to be the best education possible. 
Thank you very much. I don't know if Bjorn wants to add something, it looks like. Oh, uh, a little bit, uh, because I realized we should, uh, we were supposed to give some examples uh, and, um, and not just be like broadly. Um, and uh, well, just one thing first in general about well, student participation, which would be something like this, that um, it's not enough to know if students are happy or um, this is, uh, not satisfied with the education. You have to know why, and 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 you have to include students in uh, the development at all levels um, to be able to to develop um, the university and, and the the subjects and and so on. Um, uh, in a good way. I, I think that you can do that much better if students are involved. Um, but then also specifically for um, professional higher education, um, I wanted to say that this, in my experience, has been quite difficult uh, some places, um, mostly because, uh, well, of the diversity and maybe that well many of our universities i mean uh, applied sciences are younger and more spread out and often students there uh, well they and the universities themselves they don't have um as good of a structure and student organizations they are uh, not as um institutionalized in a way um, so that uh, it's more difficult to participate so that you get less of it and that could be an issue for for, for professional higher education institutions um, more than for the traditional universities um, yeah but that doesn't mean it's I mean then then it should be actually um it's very important that then the universities um contribute uh, compensating for that uh, those difficulties a uh, good point Bjorn, about the example and one thing that i think that should be brought is uh like a sort of a student teacher meeting before courses so that you could actually discuss and plan on how the course is going to go. So you can think about the way the course is going to be done, how it's going to be assessed, what kind of options do you have? Does it have to be physical in class? Should it be hybrid? Or can it be just study at home and do an exam? Or is it going to be an exam? All of these kind of stuff, like effect on whether or not a student is motiv motivated and would be engaging more in the education and affecting stuff. So I believe like this kind of a low level engagement right in the first hand would bring about major changes and major increase in motivation in students. So I guess we can agree that there's a, a direct link and correlation between student engagement and involvement in, in quality assurance processes, right? Okay. Um, so how, I would like to hear from you also on how do you see the role of higher education institutions and their staff uh, in supporting this uh, student engagement, specifically the staff, what can, how can they facilitate this process? <laughs> I, I like this little competition we have, which one says first, uh, but, uh, one thing that I can think of is just educating staff on what kind of options there are or what kind of things can they actually give uh, like access to the students. Like uh, one thing that we did last year was get both staff and students educated on student advocacy, what it is, what does it mean, how do you get access to it. So just giving that knowledge gave them the tool that they needed, like the number of times that I got faculty staff calling because they were worried about a student's well-being. They're like, 
oh, I'm worried about the student, they're, they're in such, such and such a situation, is there something you can do to help? That itself was beneficial. Like, I wouldn't say that it needs to be big and grand, but even as little as just educating and informing the staff of what you can do. Okay. Um, I'll start off with the role of the higher education institutions uh, on supporting non-traditional students in their engagement. Uh, so then I would say, or we'll repeat what I, one thing I said earlier with, uh, well, both um, the language barriers and, and universal access, uh, the higher education institutions can contribute on um, making those barriers um, uh, well, uh, lower <laughs> um, uh, than uh, the, well, as, as small as possible. Um, and, and also, I would say, uh, to widen it up uh, a little bit before I go down to the staff, um, that uh, I would say higher education institutions actually uh, have, like, they have a huge role in the society as like a producer of knowledge, uh, of um, well, sharing our knowledge and making like uh, making the public debates less polarized, and to um, bring facts to the table, uh, research, and so on. Um, and that could be very important in the work in the society as a whole of supporting non-traditional students uh, to have that knowledge um, uh, and to to have the universities bringing, um, well, uh, sharing research and so on. Um, and then for the staff and what they can do, uh, supporting like on the local level, um, I would actually then bring up um, supporting student organizations as something you could do. Um, uh, I know that, oh, and this is a, a funny example, but it's, it's still a good one. Um, from, from my studies, uh, one of the professors there, he, um, he helped because he was, he was studying, like, no, he was uh, teaching accounting uh because yeah i'm from accounting uh and then he helped the student organization with uh their uh revision uh basically um making sure the financials was um in order and that kind of contributions from from the staff or from the professors um could be very helpful for the student organizations for them to um to succeed. And I think the student organizations, if they are successful, that those them that they could also be uh, a good contribution in supporting uh, the non traditional students, uh, as well as the traditional ones, um, uh, both in their advocacy work, and then also in the in the and community that those uh, these uh, student organizations create. Yeah, I I remembered a few like practical examples of such situations where students who had learning difficulties, like uh, getting them just better materials that they could understand, or giving them teaching aid or learning aid where they got extra time with a teacher who could just go through stuff more like easily with them or finding tools that would work for them or like for example uh students who who are dyslexic finding them tools that will help them with the dyslexia so that they'll be able to study and learn better these was uh, i remember an alumni of my who alumnus of mine who had such problem and was like they got the best help they could they just told the teacher they're having difficulties. They were then uh, like suggested further to student services where they had help for this stuff. And they they ended up getting, I think, the highest scores of their batch. 
and they were like, that's the first time they've been able to do that. And these kind of small things really help a lot. So unless Bjorn has anything, no. So I'm really enjoying this exchange with you and it's great to hear all your insights. Very, very interesting. Uh, but now I will open the floor also to participants to um, share their questions. I saw that we have a hand raised from Jakub. Um, I'm gonna allow him to, to talk. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes, we can. All right. Hello, thanks for that. Uh, I was really enjoying listening to, to the conversation. I'm Jakub from Russia now, but uh, was in the student movement before a bit. Uh, so so I, I kind of re realized the topic, but now actually in the in the sector of professional higher education institutions, uh, looking down a bit more, and we've heard over some activities of that Russia was carrying out, that sometimes even the, you know, the starting point and the problem of universities applied uh, uh, sciences is sometimes, uh, you know, like re, re, reawakening the, the students' participation on the universities, because sometimes either because of the obstacles of COVID or because of non-existence tradition of students' organizations in the universities, it might be a case that it's not, you know, well established in a way that students take care of themselves in the sense of building up the new communities, passing the knowledge for the further generation. So I wanted to, first of all, ask if your institutions have a we have a good examples on how UASs are onboarding students into their activities and does it fall only on the students organization on there perhaps any activities done by the management and for example do you know the cases of actually re-establishing the students union for example in the UASs because the main problem that that we we've seen that is that for example there is a willingness from the university that to have the student representation strong and so on but there might be not you know quite interest and uh, or maybe the support is not given in the direction that is actually working so i would like to orient this question about the practices like how 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 it could be done how how to also help the universities to to tackle this if that's not the case that it's you know auto uh, running quite uh, quite without any 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 problems yeah thanks um Okay, so where to begin? I mean, um, we do a lot of work. Uh, I, I would like to start with that. Uh, ourselves in the National Union of Students in Norway, uh, helping the local student unions establish and to develop um, and to, well, um, uh, and to, to work, I mean, to, to make them work. Um, uh, as well as possible um and uh, uh we do surveys trying to map out who is facilitating more uh and and what should be done um at the local level trying to make the universities compete a little bit on being better at facilitating for for the local student units um uh, there is, I would, I am, I, uh, yeah, I agree a lot with with your uh, description. Uh, first of all, uh, when it comes to student organizations more broadly, um, with not having like necessarily the traditions, uh, and and I believe that I mean it has to come from the student, but at the same time, uh, the universities can do a lot on facilitating for that. Uh, culture to develop and the organizations to succeed. Um, it could be having like you you need to have some physical space. So that's I mean with the with the that's yeah one thing you can do. You can facilitate with uh, physical space for for students to uh, have well to develop these organizations, uh, and you could have like financial contributions um but then i would also stress the necessity of um helping these all well, the administrative part of it um and that could be from the student uh no i mean from the university uh administrative stuff i mean for them to to um supply the student organizations with some sort of 
assistance. Um, um, but so that, I mean, I would, um, there is a need for these, especially the young organizations that haven't developed uh, all the traditions and culture and the organizational uh, structures already. Uh, there is a need for for assistance um, from the university um, in addition to the, those more uh, concrete uh, uh, measures that you could do. Um, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll stop there and maybe add something later. <laughs> uh in finland i'm just going to go with a different few different levels over here but the legislation itself uh basically demands that for an institution of higher education there has to be a student union so without without one the other cannot exist so that by law itself has been made that that system would no matter what begin from there and then uh, in cases where, say, that the student union is not really functioning properly, that's where our national union's duty comes in, where we go and help them out and do stuff. And to, to maintain this kind of a situation where you're always in touch with what's happening with the, with the local unions and to give them help, we have the system of godparents, so to speak. So each of us board members board members and chair people in the national union have four subunions that we are godparents to so we are basically their first hand uh, connection for any kind of question they need any kind of support or help they need so at times where say that they're having difficulties with uh, the bureaucracy of stuff they do not know how to run something then we would as quite literally even go there and do like work with them show them step by step how to do these things and at the same time i, I believe because of the legislation the university does not really have to worry that students would never be there but what the university the universities and universities of applied sciences do is give us opportunities where we can reflect, where we can actually give them feedback, where we can actually like uh, give like the most necessary feedback, not be like, oh, I'm angry, I want to say something, not that, but like, okay, we are having problems with education. So there's a direct pathway for that built. So these structures and these possibilities that the university has provided are used as tools for students and unions to be able to like promote and do the advocacy. Thank you both. I hope the question was clarified. We have another hand raised from Nick. Nick, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much. Hi, I'm, I'm Nick Herens. I work for Knowledge Innovation Center um, in Malta. I'm also part of this project, Inclusive uh, PhD, um, and I have also a long history in student movement. So I'm, um, I just want to say a little bit more about um, how this project that we are doing, um, we, we are trying to combine the idea of making um, PhD education more inclusive and to promote student engagement. But we have touched on those two topics, um, but especially want to combine it. So how can we make student engagement um, in all the official and non-official ways more inclusive? And I would like to hear a bit more about that from you. Um, uh, because um, in my experience, at least, um, for example, student unions, they do a lot of work on making their institutions more inclusive um, and really good work generally but i at the same time i don't think i've ever seen any student council for example or student union board which was really reflective to the diversity of their own students um so most um either student councils or student uh, unions or um university councils they still have difficulty attracting students from non-traditional student uh non-traditional backgrounds um and that was the same the case as when I was a student representative. 
Um, there's some ways in which I've seen some unions uh, or some some systems dealing with that. So, for example, I, I've been working a lot in the UK, where it's quite normal that you have specific uh, officers for different groups. So you can have a dis, di, uh, disabled students officer or a black students officer or a women's officer. That's one way. Um, also, in my own university, when I was back in Holland, we had a lot of international students and we created a separate international student council, which was next to the, the Dutch student council. Um, actually, later on, they were integrated, um, which was really interesting to make it all in English. Um, so those are ways to do it. I, I just wonder, why, why, how do you think about that? Because I also know there's pros and cons to those kind of solutions. There's an idea of, do you integrate all the different students or do you want to have separate voices? Uh, what are your thoughts about different ways of indeed making really the student representation on the maybe the highest level more inclusive to, to non-traditional students? Thank you. You want to go first or should I? Well, um, I can I can give it a go shot. Ahead. Go ahead. I, I think those... Um, uh, examples you mentioned are are good ones. I mean, to have officers uh, for different uh, topics to have, I mean, issues or uh, yeah, um, underrepresented groups uh, of, of students. Um, and um, yeah, me myself, I'm working with international students. That's also, I would say, some sort of non traditional. Um, uh, student um, and um, we have a, a council ourselves within the National Union of Students uh, in Norway and um, also we do have uh, international officers locally a lot of places um, uh, and, and, and I find that very helpful to have a council um, uh, helping me representing at least um, uh, the international students in Norway um, because then we do have like we do have some international students in those uh, in that council and also uh, we have a separate organization as well uh, so I work a lot with um, with them and with uh, Erasmus student network um, when it comes to, for example, universal, universally accessible universities, we do work with, um, uh, well, organizations um, that are specifically specific for certain types of disabilities. So, for example, with uh, with the uh, organization of uh, what is it called, like you have reduced reduced visibility um, um and we try i mean so they they also have like we do have a lot of specific organizations in our way uh for those um uh, disabilities but then we try to at least include them and to work with them in our policy development um but yeah i do agree that we should have had more um uh, more non-traditional students um uh representing students in Norway as well. Um and yeah, I I think it will be difficult to at least for the students, non-traditional students that are uh more um I mean, uh, have children or or work to include them as a student representative, for example, to do full time work uh, as a student representative uh, in the National Union of Students in Norway. I think that will be difficult, um, but it's for a lot of other uh, non traditional students. I think we should do a lot better than than we have have done so far. Thank you, Bjorn. I will now ask Adele to keep it short since we need to move to the presentation. So two minutes, if possible. Adele, thank you. Uh, about trying to be more inclusive with representation, I feel like the it's a very big, difficult 
topic to just say that, oh, it's this, this is the answer to it. Because the problem is that you need people to be able to represent themselves. Because I cannot talk for someone, someone who I don't know or the challenges that they feel. I can assume, I can like assimilate what it could be. And like with that knowledge, try and do things. But what I believe and what I am doing myself is being represent representing myself, taking those steps where normally people or like non-traditional students wouldn't go for. Because with complete honesty, uh, in Samok, I'm in, in its 26 year history, I'm the first person of color, first person with international background, first immigrant. And like these kind of things do not ha happen because you just give the opportunity. Sometimes you have to take it. And the thing is like being, giving the facility to be able to take that and letting it known that anybody who wants to represent would be able to do that. That is pretty much the thing that we can only do is give knowledge that everybody's voice is important and everybody's voice has a meaning and that it has its place. Thank you very much, I, Nick. I hope you have your questions answered. Thanks a lot, uh, you both, Bjorn and Adel. Uh, we are now gonna move to the presentation from Yentl, uh, our uh, participation co uh, coach from Love and Region, uh, UCLL. She will uh, introduce herself and to present the initiative that you have in, in your college, university college. Before yes, thank you, Marta. I'm first gonna start sharing my screen. Um, you are sharing, but not in the presentation mode. Yes, I'm trying to get there. In the bottom page, maybe. The problem is that the black uh, yes, zoom thing is on top. <laughs> Wait a second. Exactly. If you put it a bit smaller, maybe you'll we'll be able to share. Oh, now it's very small. Wait. We, if not, we can do it for you. Um, if, if I you think I might be getting there. I'm sorry. This no worked when we, when, we, when we tried it out, but now it's exactly. not yeah, there. When, it when we need it, yeah. Now it should is work. it working now? You see, you see it in presentation mode? Now, yes. yes. It's perfect. all right. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, so thank you, uh, Marta and Yureshi, for inviting me here. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about inclusive student engagement as a driver of quality professional higher education at our institution at UCLL um, and give some yeah, best practices or good examples, um, things that I am proud of that we have uh, already accomplished. Um, but first, a bit about myself. Um, so uh, my name is Jentel Bibout, um, and I go with the pronouns she, her. Um, so I work at University Colleges Leuven Limburg, uh, just in short, UCLL, uh, in Belgium. Uh, and more particular, I'm part of student services, and uh, my job title is participation coach. And I do this for the region of Leuven. On the picture, you can see my colleague who is doing the same for uh, the other region uh, of Limburg. Um, what does it mean um, supporting like participation coach? I will be using participation and engagement a bit um, yeah, switched because it, it kind of means the same to me, uh, but I know participation might be a very literal translation from that. Um, so I've worked here for almost two years now and I am supporting student engagement at UCLL. Um, I'm gonna elaborate a bit more on that further in the presentation. Um, and I also wanted to say I've, I've come in this position uh, mostly thanks to my own experiences uh, as a student representative while I was studying. Um, it's since day one that I was at uni um, that I joined the student union, um, joined the student council, became president eventually of my own student union and then later on joined LOCO which is um, an umbrella organization for all 
student unions in Leuven, and they represent the Leuven students, uh, for instance, at the city. So that's where my experience comes from. Then a bit about the context of UCLL. Um, so at UCLL, we offer professional higher education. It makes probably makes sense since the, the topic of the inclusive project, right? Um, so that means that our students only stay for two to maximum four years at our school if they follow a normal project. Uh, uh, traject. Uh, students are very often off campus uh, because they have internships. I think that's from the second year on, sometimes even already in the first year that they go for some weeks on, on internships. And in their third year, they're mostly like both semesters just uh, off campus doing internships. Uh, graduate degree programs um, that last two years often have classes in the evening, so they're all also not that often on the campus. Um, and then third, we have a lot of non-traditional students. I put it there like that, um, but what does that even mean? I think it's a definition that probably changes all the time, changes over time, and might include and exclude groups um, Yeah, as time goes by. Um, however, for the following examples, I've sticked to the, I've stuck, I stick to the uh, definition that uh, Marta gave earlier, such as um, students with disabilities, with a migration background, um, more mature students, uh, et cetera. Um, but that means, so the three of those things mean that uh, engagement comes and goes. Uh, and it is often short-term interest-based or project-oriented. Um, I also like to give a disclaimer at this point. Uh, I and we are definitely not perfect either yet, let's hope. Um, and we're still learning. So um, as, as a coach, I also feel that um, engagement is that it comes and goes. And it's not always easy to keep up with the good initiatives or to keep uh, activities going. Um, in my opinion, most important is that student-led initiatives uh, stay in students' hands and that we don't take it away from them um, so that we also yeah, anticipate on what they want or what they need. Um, so that's a little disclaimer I wanted to give before starting and going over to the examples. Um, so I tried to divide some good examples in categories. You will see them on, on the top. And the first one there is a LGBTQIA plus category. Uh, and there we have our own uh, student union spectrum. They arose almost four years ago. Um, and back then, I was not even working yet at UCLL, um, but my colleague Yasmin uh, helped them getting started. Uh, Back then they were a group of enthusiastic students at UCLL and they wanted to get involved and unite around the topic LGBTQIA+. Um, all the way up until now, they are a recognized student association rec with recognized, I mean, they are recognized by our school. Uh, they can receive support, receive funding. Um, and their slogan is where you can just be yourself. That's why I put it there uh, uh, as well. Their main focus is to create a safe space for all LGBTQIA plus students, but also for interested sympathizers. So everybody's welcome at their activities. You just have to be yeah, a sympathizer of these kind of topics and interested in them. Uh, but they also try and uh, give sensibilization and information about these kinds of topics, um, which they find important themselves, which they believe to be important for uh, their fellow students. Um, they used to do this at UCLL level, uh, but they've grown quite known, quite big in, in the city of Leuven. So they're, they're even expanding um, outside of UCLL as well now with their activities. So that's very nice to see. Uh, we're very proud of them. Um, UCLL still regards Spectrum as an important partner though, uh, when LGBTQIA plus relevant topics are discussed. Uh, in policy decisions or infrastructure, um, let's say uh, gender gender neutral toilets, for instance, we also try and, and consult the students who are in spectrum to help us making decisions there. 
they were also consulted when we drafted a, a policy about inclusion at our school. Yeah, I always uh, added some pictures of the things they organize or they do. So then uh, on international um, level, we have two student unions actually. I'm starting with Insignia because they are the oldest, uh, but still very, very new. Uh, they arose almost two years ago. Um, I think they just got started when I uh, started working at UCLL. Uh, I always have the then and now comparison. So then there were some enthusiastic international students and they wanted to provide support, entertainment and a community for all international students at UCLL. Now they're a recognized student association as well. And they have got you, that's also their slogan. Um, their main focus is definitely organizing activities for international students at UCLL, trying to yeah, create a big international community um, at our school. Also, Insignia, the same story as Spectrum actually is growing bigger and bigger and also uh, outside of the UCLL boundaries. Uh, um, they appear to be organizing the best parties in Leuven. I hear that from a lot of international students who are also not UCLL students. So that's something to be proud of as well, uh, I think. UCLL cooperate, still cooperates with Insignia when we organize events for international students, such as the Welcome Week, which is happening um, right before an academic year or right before the, sem the second semester starts. Uh, and we also consult them when we make decisions that are relevant for international students at UCLL or when we want to hear the opinion of international students uh, as well, which is quite often. Um, Uh, yeah, okay, sorry. <laughs> Some pictures of uh, insignias. And then our other international student association is uh, Amani. Amani arose last year. Um, they actually uh, came to me for help. So one of the, the president of Amani was actually a member of Insignia and felt another need was there. And they were a group of passionate international students and they wanted to support and create a community for students specifically of black African and Caribbean descent. Um, now they are also a recognized student association that is a home away from home. Um, they are welcoming and they are open to all students, but their main focus is promote intellectual, social, cultural and career advancement of these this group of Black, African, and Caribbean descent students. Um, they like to provide a space to empower uh, students, to motivate students, but also to have fun. It's not only serious business, but uh, they really want to make a difference for these students. UCLL also cooperates with Amani. We see them as an important partner as well when we organize events for international students. Um, and same as with Insignia, we consult them when making decisions relevant for them, but also when talking about um, diversity or um, if some, uh, for instance, ra a racism issue would come up, uh, Amani would definitely, they, they told us themselves, they would like to be involved in, the, in these topics, in these discussions. And we're, as UCLL, definitely um, asking for the input of them uh, in those kind of situations. And then um, another form of informal uh, student engagement that we have at UCLL is based on hobbies and uh, the, the most known one uh, is our gaming community. It probably sounds a bit strange that this is also a form of engagement. However, we, we definitely believe it is. Uh, the gaming community arose during the COVID period and it started on Discord. So that's about three years now. They were just some passionate gaming students and they wanted to create a network, a community with other gamers of our school. They wanted to connect with them. Uh, now they're also a recognized student association and they're actually the biggest gaming community in Belgium. Uh, so that's very cool. 
Uh, their main focus is definitely creating connections between like-minded students who enjoy gaming. Um, so when they have like a shared interest, um, which in this case is gaming, they can also unite themselves. And um, it doesn't necessarily have to end up in becoming a recognized student association, but there are possibilities, uh, just as uh, is the case here. Um, they are also organize gaming events on campus and they participate in tournaments against other schools uh, in Belgium and I think also internationally. So quite impressive, uh, if you ask me. Um, UCLL provides support for the gaming community, just like they do for the, the previous named uh, associations. Um, but for instance, when they organize an event on campus, uh, my colleague in Limburg or me, we help them uh, preparing the event logistically, et cetera. Um, or when they participate in tournaments, they can uh, get some uh, sponsorship uh, from the school. Um, another one based on a, a common interest, I think, uh, is sustainability. And uh, there we have uh, a bit a different example than the previous ones, um, talking about our impact teams here. They're not really a student union, um, but something else. Uh, so they st we started this project this academic year and it's in cooperation with uh, SOS International. And we are actually part of the green impact movement. Um, so teams can organize sustainability related actions, but what is, so special about those teams is that they exist out of staff members and students in cooperation. Uh, these students, we call them IPAs, that's uh, um, short for Impact Teams Project Assistance, um, and they get trained. So they receive a training before uh, having, having to enter a team. It's totally voluntarily. Uh, just want to make that clear. Uh, they are being coached as well. So um, we organize regular check-ins with all of them, but also if they would need me um, separately, they know how to reach out to me. And at the end of their, um, their, their, um, their year of being active as an IPA, uh, they receive a digital badge that they can add to their CV. Um, this is actually open to all students, so everybody can become an IPA if they like to. Um, but if they feel if they feel like this is a bit too big of a commitment because it's we're talking about, I think seven months in the academic year, uh, they can also decide to become a student auditor because that's this is also part of our impact teams is that audits are done at the end. Um, where we check whether the teams did um, how many points they receive for each action, etc. Uh, also, student auditors receive a training for this, and they receive a certificate and a letter of recommendation when they've ended doing their audits. Um, so these are ways to how we like to involve all types of students in this sustainability project uh, at our school. And um, then like one last bigger example um, are our formal associations uh, within student participation at UCLL. Um, we have uh, a lot of different, uh, different councils and associations. I, I just summed some up there. So general student council, the student central, which is at campus level. Um, then at a study program level, we have the study program uh, student council. And for this, we try to attract all types of students. And with this, I mean traditional and non-traditional students. Um, how do we try to do this? We always uh, send out open calls. So for every meeting that is being organized by uh, these yeah, councils or, or associations, there's an open call. The invitation is always published online and the agenda as well. So it appears on our intranet. Um, Sometimes you have a mailing list that we can use. It depends on which study program or, or which campus we're talking about. Um, but in this way, we hope that everybody yeah, feels a bit of a connection or a link with the student unions. 
And um, if they see something on the agenda that is relevant for them or that they are interested in, or they have an idea about or something to say about it, they can just join for once. Uh, so participation is without obligation. It's not when you come to one um, meeting that you have to be in all meetings. You can just decide whether you want to join or not, depending on the topics. Um, of course, we like for most of these uh, to have a, a central group that is always coming, you know, like a president and a, a vice president, etc. cetera. Um, but further, there are just students popping in and out all the time, depending on the topics. Um, we also offer coaching, that is me, uh, but trainings and other support um, to students. For instance, we have a very general student rep training uh, that you can also join if you're not a student rep yet. In this training, we like to just inform them about the possibilities at UCLL uh, and, and tell them that they are welcome wherever they like to be. Um, I feel like thanks to these things, uh, improvement is being made. Um, some examples are General Student Council this, this year uh, has a mature uh, president with a family, with, with a, a wife and children at home, um, but he's still the president of our General Student Council. Um, and we have multiple lifelong learners in actually all of these uh, councils. So that's something very nice that we've already uh, manage to reach out to them and to attract them towards these uh, unions. Um, we also have international and just Belgian members in, uh, especially at our Proximus campus, which is where most international students uh, have their classes. For instance, the Student Central there, which is um, yeah a discussion forum on campus level. There, that's mostly in English because international students and um, the Dutch speaking students just join there together. And um, we also manage to attract some students with a migrant background right now uh, in our general student council and in the study program student councils. So improvements are being made and that's something to be very proud of, I think. Last but not least, I wanted to mention that we created a cross course on student participation. So that's actually um, yeah, a course that students can take up no matter in which study program they are. And it's worth three credits. And we feel this is a way of showing our appreci appreciation sorry, for all forms of student engagement. So whether you're in a student union or uh, an association, um, if you're really a student rep or yeah, just member of one of the previous named associations, you can actually decide to take up this course and it gives you some yeah, spare time in your curriculum that you can invest in your role as a student participant, right? So um, I don't know if that's completely clear like this, but I just wanted to mention that that is something that we started this academic year and um, it's the first time. And now we have about 25 students who take up this course. There are more student, student participants than that, but not all of them have the space for it in their curricula or um, did know that it existed from now on. So then my role as a coach in all of this is that I am mostly a, a point of contact for all these student participants, all these students that are active as a representative or want to be active as a representative. Um, I don't know if all of them know that I exist, but the ones that do know, uh, they they find me very often and I feel like I can lower the threshold a bit for them. Um, so I am the link between these student associations uh, and between the, the school. I support and I facilitate. Um, so with that, I mean logistically, but also administrative, communicative, organizational, um, the formal and informal student association. So for all of them, I am here to help out, um, especially when getting started. But afterwards, I'm of course still uh, their point of contact. I uh, It's my job to offer or to create trainings based on the needs of the student representatives. So I like to ask them often enough, um, what what would you like to be, be following? What What is it that you need? 
um, in order to develop the necessary skills uh, that as a student representative. Some of them, of course, I offer uh, myself, but some of them I ask other colleagues or um, experts to go and give a training to our students. Because we believe that being trained is actually more important than being elected. That doesn't mean that there are no elections. Um, for our general student council, it's obligatory to uh, hold an election. But for all others, we actually feel like it's more important to give them proper training and to support them where possible, um, because everybody can be a student rep uh, if you just like encourage them and empower them. Um, and then I inspire or I try to inspire. Uh, I keep an eye open for new initiatives. Um, try to be as accessible as possible uh, so that students know how to find me when they have an idea to organize a project, a, a group, uh, a get together, uh, whatever. And probably there's more that I'm leaving out right now, uh, but this is very short, what I mean for all previous uh, named slides. So then I wanted to thank you uh, for giving me the floor and, um, just wondering if there are any questions and you can contact me via the email address that is in the slide if there is something else you'd like to talk to me about. Thank you very much, Jentel, for this great overview of what you do at UCLL. Um, as Jentel said, you are free to ask questions, to, to comment on, on what has been presented. You can either type it in the chat or the Q&A. Um, or raise your hand, we'll give you the floor as before. I will stop sharing maybe already. Yeah, yeah, sure. Also from, from the previous panelists, if you have any question, any comment you would like to, to address to Yentel. If not, I do have some questions, <laughs> a couple of them. Uh, you mentioned that sometimes the, the students know about your existence, the existence and your work, uh, but sometimes they don't. Uh, how do you do to make it visible that you are doing all of this uh, for them, for their benefit, for them to enjoy more uh, their experience? Yeah, it's a it's a very good question, Marta. It's it's something that I'm. Uh still thinking about myself how what is now the perfect way to communicate about uh, my position here um now most important i think is that the student reps know how to find me and 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 that the ex existing student uh, uh, participants know that i'm here to help them to support them um however i really like to show my face at all our campuses sometimes and then they're like oh, are you a part of the student union as well? And I'm like, oh no, I support them. I'm actually a staff member, this is my job. Um, and that's so spontaneously, that's mostly how our people afterwards remember, oh yeah, there, there was Jentel who's in this. It's also a lot of teachers, um, colleagues of mine know that I do this as a job. So if they hear things, um, wandering around they also try to reach out to me or send the students straight towards me um, and I think that's the way to go just go show myself talk about what I do uh, and let them know that there are possibilities for all of them yeah in my view this is great that you do it in a, such an organic way uh, and it it works um, and you see the results right uh, I would like to know as you as part of uh, participation, uh, being a participation coach, how do you assess um, the impact that these practices have uh, in the students, in the students' community? Yeah. Yeah, I think I've mentioned it quite a few times that I'm like proud of this or proud of that. And I, I really am, uh, I think Bjorn and Adele also mentioned it when, when they were speaking. Um, after COVID, you had to reawaken some, some councils, some uh, student associations, and it was definitely a, a tough time for me as well. I thought, oh my God, there is no one willing to share their, their meaning, to come and, and lift up their voice. Um, but bit by bit, um, I saw a student council, and, and I'm talking about our general student council now, 
Um, I saw them growing from there. There literally was no one left uh, when I started. We started from zero. And now at our last meeting, there were 20 students there. So that, that's for me how I can sense that we're growing. And OK, not all 20 of them are um, a, a member of the, the council or are in the board, as I can, if I can say it like that. But they came and they wanted to share their opinion on one or more of the topics on the agenda. And I think that's the most yeah, impact that I can feel. And also starting up Amani um, is something that I, I did myself uh, while I was already working at UCLL. And I think that's very powerful to see that it rises, it, it comes bottom up and you just help them, you give them a platform and the rest they manage themselves, yeah. And do you have any information about if these students that you are um, involving in these initiatives uh, are also uh, taking part in quality assurance processes and consultations? Yeah, um, some of them definitely are. So you, you can see that um, there's a particular group that, that you see in multiple councils or in multiple meetings. Um, so definitely, but not all of them. So there's also some that are more... Um, sporadically, I don't know if that's the correct word, but joining uh, the meetings um, and quality, is, uh, quality assurance wise, um, they also know via me how to get to the right student group that they want to um, involve in a certain research project or, or whatever. They always ask me if they can uh, come by on a on a meeting of the, of the student councils, and then they present their topic, they ask, oh, is there anybody who wants to be involved? Or they discuss it right there. So sometimes it's with a representative that they work, sometimes it's just on the meeting with everyone who is there at that moment. So they are definitely being involved, uh, but it's not always all of them. Yes, but they are, at least you have that information and it's yeah, definitely. On, on that area. I don't know if we have any question um, from the participants. I don't see it, but you can raise the hand. And this course that you mentioned, Yantel, uh, this uh, cross-course student participation, right? Uh, yeah. Is it open for everybody? Um, so if yes. you can, uh, if you don't have it handy, never mind. We'll send it later with a follow-up email. Or if you can send it uh, in the chat so people can have a look at it. I think it could be interesting. Yeah, I think the so there's this file, right, that, that says it's in Dutch, though. So you'll have to get it through Google Translate. Mm -hmm. um, but I can definitely send it. Uh, I will check if we still have some uh, some closure of the of the webinar left. Then I can send it in the in the chat. OK, that's that would be very nice. Um, I don't know if the colleagues uh, want to ask something, if they knew about this uh, initiative at UCLL in Belgium, for example. My my colleagues or? Uh, uh, the colleagues, uh, the panelists, sorry. I Here, okay, sorry. I was not specific, uh, Adel and Bjorn. Well, um, I, I didn't know of uh, well, any initiative at the UCLL uh, before this, I, I can relate to a lot of it. I think you're doing, it seems like you're doing a very good job uh, <laughs> at UCLL. Thank you. Um, we, I mean, what, what I can relate to, for example, we do have the same, like this course uh, as well, but it's not, it's not really, a, from, from my university, it hasn't been, used a lot it's there but it's not known um so so that's an issue uh, for for students actually to get to know it about it and to to build up that culture um uh, of actually having um all well, student participation and so on so um so to me it seems like i mean we, we have a lot of the same uh initiatives but um but uh, i mean uh, yeah especially now with covid it's very difficult to to um to to have that culture and to well make student participates even though the initiatives and the possibilities are there uh in in the structure of it um 
I just I love the thing that the whole presentation because it just reminds me of my whole last year. That's basically what we did. Like we hired somebody who was a uh, expert in community stuff, like knowledge and like community building and stuff like that. And we pretty much did similar kind of stuff where we all accept the course. That is something that I really wanted to bring, but I didn't have the resources to be able to work on it myself. So it was a difficult thing to be like, okay, I need to prioritize other stuff too. But like, for example, clubs, when when I started last year in our local union, we had, what, three clubs? Now we have 14. And then our associate student associations, they like we have 13 of them, each representing their own fields, each representing their own stuff. And the best part is like they get to do all kinds of things by themselves. Like they have a full board, like the union associations, they are boards, they have all kinds of structures, they have funding, they have everything. And like the clubs were something that uh, we brought to make it easier for students to access that. And that was like a big hit for like just the massive growth that it had and like the different kind of clubs and different kind of communities that it built. Like this is like the beauty I feel of like student activism is seeing this community being built and enjoying that little things like literally like you told growing from nothing and that's just amazing. Yeah, I agree totally. Yeah, so now we are coming to when to the end of our webinar. Um, I will, as mentioned, I will send you a follow-up email with uh, some details uh, that we discussed and uh, with the survey. I see a question, okay. Okay, we, ha we have a question uh, in the chat. I don't know if Yentel can see that. Would you, would you be able to elaborate a bit on this? Sorry that I missed this. this. Yes, no worries. I'll try to keep it short. Um, this is probably something I learned from the students uh, in the Spectrum Student Union. Um, it's very important to them, um, or, or, or to them, not specifically only to them, but to uh, students who don't identify as uh, the gender or, or the, that you would think uh, at first sight, right? Or students who are transitioning. Um, so for, for these students, it's actually a big help and it just makes it normal. Um, to introduce yourself with the with your pronouns. Uh, I also always try to do it um, when writing, or uh, I also put it in my name here on the screen. Um, it's in my email, um, how do you say it? Autograph <laughs> um, at the bottom, because I just think it helps a lot for students who don't identify as they should identify according to the, to the society, right? Um, to make it normal. And, and last time that we had a, a meeting with a lot of new students, um, uh, my colleague Yasmin actually, uh, she started the meeting by introducing herself. And um, we we um, we said before, we agreed before that we were gonna introduce ourselves with the pronouns and the students all mentioned in the, at the end that they really appreciated that, um, that we just do it so spontaneously. Um, so, Elisha or uh, Elisha, I'm sorry if I pronounce it wrongly. I hope this is um, elaborated enough. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> and yeah, I, I allowed uh, Elisha to, to say something if she, if she would like to. Ah, yeah, thank you. Okay, so um, I'm gonna close now this the webinar. Um, by thanking thanking the the speakers, the, the panelists from from today, uh, I think we've learned a lot. We exchanged a lot, and it's a pleasure to hear from your experiences um, in the student engagement in different uh, ways. Uh, and as mentioned before, we are going to send you a follow up email, and we'll ask you to fill in the survey uh, satisfaction the survey about this uh, this webinar. I hope you've enjoyed um, and uh, hope to see you soon. Bye. <laughs>